Hi, Sarah. How are you? What's up? How's it going, Steve? I'm doing good. Where are you at the moment? I'm in Los Angeles. Home sweet home. Yes. Are you in Montreal? I am in Montreal. I'm not originally from Montreal. I'm from England, but okay. I, uh, I'm now based in Montreal. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's a cool city. Have you been cool, here? Yeah, I've not, but I really want to go. I've only, I've only heard good things about it. Yeah. So I'm really interested in, um, <laughs> in you because like, You've got a good story and, you know, you dabble in quite a few different things, but I want to explore like where you came from musically, like going back as a little kid, what was the first mm-hmm. thing you remember listening to at home? Um, you know, I think my parents were playing, played a lot of the records that they grew up listening to or that like struck them when they were in high school, which is everything from Stevie Wonder to Simon and Garfunkel to um Willie Nelson to like my dad has this like really awful disco like (laughs) kick that he went through that definitely is like a little bit in the background and um yeah so that was definitely like early stuff oh I I also feel like once I was in middle school you know I I kind of like dug more into punk world and into jazz world and and kind of like tried to like un you know break out of my boxes of music that was like in my dad's car you know (laughs) that was gonna be my next question is do you remember like a specific band or album that became your own rather than something that your parents had in the house totally yeah I mean when I was in middle school I started taking drum lessons and I feel like that was a huge um game changer because all of a sudden I was like trying to find music that I could like rock to so I was like finding about finding out about Green Day and Blink-182 and also like Led Zeppelin for my drum teacher and Nirvana and like sort of like anything that you that you're like oh that has a great drum part it was like stuff that started to be on my radar um as well as sort of like a a weirdly like more out taste in like jazz and like kind of scholastic feeling music because I was playing music in school and like that's what I thought was cool and I and I wanted to be I think sort of esoteric compared to like whatever my friends are listening to on the radio um so I had to go back and do a lot of like education about pop from like 2000 to 2007 when (laughs) once I was like older and and could appreciate it a little more (laughs) yeah because I feel like what I know about you your music taste is very varied I know you've got a heavy punk influence um from growing up but I feel like you're you're open to all kinds of genres and you kind of confirmed it there and you you also like the pop and R&B and stuff like that have you always been like that oh yeah I mean I think the one sort of like dark era was probably from like age 12 to like 16 I feel like I really wanted to be different than the people around me and so I dug a lot deeper into sort of punk and um stuff that wasn't your average listening I think for a teenager I would like go to the library and like you know you could get cds from the library and burn them basically on your computer for free and like you know um but yeah now you know I listen to everything and I, I I'm a total poptimist I love pop music I think it's like such a wonderful it really is like craft at its highest potential I think and and they've sort of cracked this code into like you know, decoding people's brains and what they love about music. Um, but yeah, everything from like fully whatever's on the charts um, to, you know, I really loved, actually I'm wearing this Philip Glass shirt because I was, nice I, started, <laughs> I, I was watching this um, TV show called a hundred foot wave and like, and he does all the music in, you know, in his very like oceanic ambient fashion. And so um yeah, there's kind of like nothing that's off the table for me anymore. I feel like there's there's a lot of good in, in most music. So when you think about your childhood, is there one album that you think of? Like, let's let's take you back to maybe like 14. Is there an album from around that time that you just think you played to death? Uh, definitely Blink-182, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket was like hugely, hugely on heavy rotation. I feel like weirdly like 
I had this Miles Davis like greatest hits record that I really loved because right. you know the dr- drummers are Tony Williams and Philly Joe Jones and like all these sort of like amazing drummers that I I was really into in high school. Other than that, uh, the Minor Threat record was on heavy rotation for sure. Stevie Wonder songs in the key of life was weirdly kind of continued to be a favorite record of mine even from when I was a kid until now. So as I expected, really kind of across the board selection of records, even as a teenager, right? Which a lot of people, when they're in their teenage years, they kind of go down one path musically and then maybe later on they start to broaden their horizons. But it feels like you've done that from a very early age. Do you feel like that has basically formed the sound of your band moving forward? Like, there's all those elements kind of come into one definitely yeah I mean I I think that the way I write is often sort of compiling stuff that I don't even know that I'm compiling and so the more I can get my hands on the more color palettes that I have to choose from basically in making music and and I think I think that whether I'm like realizing it or not I'm always referencing my heroes and I'm always sort of thinking about my favorite writers um and my favorite records that have been like playing in the background of my life yeah and and obviously we've had this kind of downtime over the last year and a half due to covid what what role has music played in your life during that time um you know i think towards the beginning of when everything shut down i was walking around a lot and so I was just trying to listen to like everything new that came out and I was like trying to catch up on records that I had missed or records that were being talked about and I you know I wanted to sort of like get a better grasp on like what was new um and then I went through sort of this thing where I was like listening to like Harry Nilsson stuff exclusively for some reason like I just was like went back to all that stuff and it's like comfort food yeah kind of it is like comfort food and I feel like his sort of like brand of pop specifically is like really timeless and like has a lot of stuff going on in it that's very interesting and very um sort of out compared to like what his contemporaries were doing yeah I mean I feel like I kind of like went through a wave there was definitely a a chunk of the pandemic where I like wasn't really listening to anything because I was working on my own stuff and also because it just like wasn't I was just kind of needed a break and was like reading a lot more listening to podcasts or just sort of like walking around the world with without headphones in Um, but yeah it it definitely comes and goes a little bit in waves over the course of this last year and a half and I think lately I have been sort of absorbing a lot more music and trying to um, you know every time I think about an album that I want I want to make sure I listen to all the way through I like have this playlist of just like stuff that I called up next and it's just like records that I've been meaning to check out for a while (laughs) right so in in that time what records have you got excited about what's really grabbed your attention that you've been telling your friends about dang that's a hard question I feel like there's been a lot um the Katie Kirby record I absolutely love I think that that is one of my favorite albums that's come out in a long time, actually. What else has, I feel like I have to look at my Spotify to like, uh, to cross check myself here. Cause, um, I don't know. I I got like into a lot of like old, like country, you know, like from the fifties, like sort of bread and butter Western and country music. Um, cause the storytelling is so vivid and and weird. Um, (laughs) which I really love. I like have been going through like a little bit of a death grips phase (laughs) again, um, which just like sort of sonically is interesting to me. Um, There's this new artist called Dora Jar, two words like Dora and Jar, um, who put out an EP and and it's, it's really interesting and really exciting production and writing. So let's talk about your music. You've got this album coming out, which is, (laughs) let me do one more. Now, in this time, a lot of people have had time to kind of think about how they want their lives to look moving forward, like when things hopefully start opening up again, how they want to live their lives, and maybe it's given them time to kind of rethink things. And obviously, with your 
your story with your previous label. Um, have you had time to think about how you want your career to look moving forward? With and and has that in like had an effect on how this album sounds? Yeah, I mean, I think every day, whether there's a pandemic or not, we're afforded the opportunity to think about how we want our life to go or what we can do during the course of 24 hours to like work towards our goals or our dreams. Um, and I, I don't think that I necessarily took like a full regroup in the way that some people did during the pandemic or certainly not because of the pandemic. You know, the stuff with the previous label happened right at the end of 2019. So I was sort of already rethinking what was next right. um, as well as like a bunch of just life stuff that happened to, to me on a personal basis where I was forced to sort of like reckon with reality. And so, so I don't think that I was like put into a mindset that would have been different from if everything was normal. And I also think that I'm thinking about the next steps every single day. And, and I, and I plan my day like towards putting one foot towards, you know, whatever the dream feels like it is. Okay. And was it with this album, particularly, was there a catalyst moment where you're you started writing and you were like, ah, this is where I'm going to go with this, with this album. Was there an overall theme to the album? You know, the theme kind of emerged after the songs were coming together. I worked over the course of in between tours, like over the course of 2019, I would sort of just wrote as many ideas as I could. And I went into the studio with like 25 or 30 song ideas. Some were, you know, totally complete, to the point where like we were even playing some on stage already. Um, some were just like a verse idea or some were just like the form of a song with no lyric yet. And like, basically I had, I started whittling it down from there. So because there was so much on the table, I don't think I had like a concept behind this record where I was like, I'm writing this record to express like this thing. I just was making songs and then once they all kind of came more into focus and once I realized I'm working with like this many actual songs um, and, you know, sort of like chipping it down from there, it's just, it's sort of just naturally found itself a theme because it was all written in my life at around the same time. <laughs> yeah. Was there one song on the album, like you, you said that some came more fully formed and then you had bits of others. Was there one song in the album that you, that took longer to, really really finish yeah definitely i mean there, there's a song called the sway on there that has been favorite. around oh thanks yeah <laughs> um that one's been around for longer than some, like that one i think i wrote maybe even in 28 like beginning of 2018 probably maybe 2017 it's been sort of we played it we kind of took it off the list i tried to record it once it went really badly like i kind of just have had that song floating around for a really long time. And in my brain, it always sounded like a like jam band, like Dave Matthews thing. And I like really didn't want it to sound like that. But every time we played it, it kind of felt like that. Um, and it took a lot of like really pairing back to get it to the point where it is now. Um, so I feel like that one took the longest to sort of like feel good and feel how I wanted it to feel. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that you, you like to listen to albums and a lot of people these days, they just listen to playlists and individual tracks. So was the sequencing on the album important to you? Totally. Yeah. I love sequencing records. This one went through like three or four different sequences, which isn't really even that much, but, but it's really important to me um, for the people who are listening to full length albums. I feel like that is really important to those types of people. And it's important to me. And like, I love to think about, the album as like a comprehensive piece of art in its own just like each song is a comprehensive piece of art individually um, but when you put them all together you know you have an opportunity to like build the story arc or even just build an energy arc in a way that um you know is is harder to do i would say in right in three minutes or less you've obviously been working not on only on the band but you've been working as a producer and an engineer as well with some pretty cool artists uh, just off the top of my head, you've Waze Blood, Slow Dive, which is amazing. And then Logic, which is a little bit 
out there. How does working with artists like that affect how you write? You know, I think it's just cool to see what other people are doing, you know, like definitely the logic a uh, record that I worked on was a long time ago and I was just an assistant engineer at this studio in Malibu that he was working at and like uh he makes music completely different than I would you know it's like all it's all coming off an MPC and it's obviously like rap is a style that I I don't find myself often <laughs> performing on my own but like obviously I love it and I am influenced by it um and so, yeah, I mean, it's just cool to see how other people do stuff. It's it, on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, you know, tracking vocals for that Wise Blood record. It was made in such a traditional way with, you know, real musicians in the room playing the songs down live. Um, and then Natalie uh, singing on top of it, which is when I came into the picture on that record. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of cool to see what people are doing and inevitably the songs there's a song or two that gets stuck in your head and then you're like waiting and waiting and waiting till it comes out so everybody else can hear it and be excited about it too and um yeah I think it's just like how we talked about listening to a bunch of records it all just sort of is in the sauce if if one of your family members was having dinner with friends and they said uh what's what's Sarah up to these days how would they describe what you do do you think you know I have no idea. None of them really are in like entertainment or music world at all. And uh, like, for example, I had lunch um, at a family friend's house and they have a pool. So we were really excited to go swimming. And but like they wanted to get the leaves out of the pool. So I was helping clean the leaves and everybody was sort of jokingly being like, oh, you're so good at that. Like you should like pick up a side hustle. And I was like, I hate to break it to you, but like, I don't have time for a side hustle because Mm -hmm. I'm like paying my rent, making music and, you know, working with other bands. And so I feel like, you know, I think that they are really supportive and they're really excited about what I'm doing. Um, I think my dad in particular was excited to see like Rolling Stone talk about us and like sort of the, the more, um, household name publications write about us. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like everybody's just a little confused which makes sense because it's kind of, it doesn't really seem real, I think, to people who report to an office regularly. (laughs) Right. And you've toured with like quite a variety of bands as well. Like everybody from like punk bands to, well, I know you're going to be playing with a death cab soon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you go out and play to these different audiences, it, it must does it change the way that you play does it cha- change the way you choose the songs for the set totally yeah I mean I want to do our, our best showing for um whatever the audience might be uh I think at the end of the day I want to play a great set for myself and for the people in my band to feel proud of what we did but I think there's a little bit of set list catering we've done you know the sets that we've played in front of pups audience um definitely take a different direction than the sets that we've played in front of like Lucy Dacus's audience Um, and a set that we're going to do in front of the death cab audience. I think it's a little harder to predict like sort of, or to generalize what their crowd could be because they've been around for so long and they've, you know, made, they have decades worth of albums to listen to. So I feel like I can't really anticipate what to do. So I'm just going to kind of pick a bunch of songs that have us sounding our best, you know? (laughs) <laughs> yeah so if if somebody had never heard your band and they said oh play me a track I want to hear what you sound like is there anything that you would choose to play them first yeah I feel like pool hopping was kind, was kind of like peak all elements of the band firing off at the same time because it's pretty poppy and it's pretty listenable I think for your average music fan and and it's also kind of weird and wacky and high energy and we definitely try to play with a sense of humor and with a sense of performance at all times. So, so I feel like that's, that's one of the more uniquely us songs that I've put out in a while. Cool. Yeah. There's, I I love the sense of humor that you've injected into, into everything from the lyrics to the videos and even like the song titles. (laughs) And now you're getting, you know, you are getting noticed by people like Rolling Stone and even New York times and people like that. So do you, what, at this point in your career, what defines success to you? Um, 
what defines success to me is I'm going to steal this from um, this, I guess, speech writer is a, the best word I can use to describe this guy, Earl Nightingale, who says success is the progressive realization of your dreams, basically. So if you're progressively working towards accomplishing your dreams, that's success. You know, like waking me waking up every morning and feeding my dog and like working on a track feels successful to me. And I think that that I, I'm really happy that I've finally gotten to the place in my life where that's every day. Nice. Well, I'm very happy for you. Uh, <laughs> how, how do you feel the albums uh, coming out really soon? Like, do, do you get nervous or just excited about putting new music out into the world? Yeah. You know, um, it's definitely a little nerve wracking. Uh, as you know, I, I feel pretty fortunate that it seems like people are liking stuff right now, but you know, I want to just um, have like reasonable expectations and uh, just be excited that people are finally hearing this stuff at all, you know? Yeah. And you've got these Death Cab dates, you've got a, a couple of your own dates. And then what's after that? Do you have plans after that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, 2022 is sort of unannounced right now, um, but we're working on figuring out some touring um, for US and hopefully beyond. Um, and other than that, you know, just working on a few people's records before I get on the road full time. <laughs> yeah, and nice. is that tricky? Like planning who you're going to record with as well as trying to work on your own tour dates? It's a little tricky. Uh, for the most part, it's been okay. It It just sort of, it changes how much I can take on. And, and it also changes, I think, what the timeline is for a lot of artists. Um, hopefully not too much, but anytime I can spare, you know, a three to four week block, I, I try and get myself in the studio with on hottie stuff or on somebody else's stuff. Nice. Well, I wish you all the best with the album and thank you. Hopefully you'll get out on the road and beyond the U S up to, up to Montreal and Canada um, I hope so. Maybe next year. So I look forward to seeing you on a stage uh, at that point. But in the meantime, it's been really nice chatting with you. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bye. Steve. All right. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Good to meet you. All right. You too. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.